Okay, just a quick word from me tonight. Um, it's really uh, very thrilling, actually, to be kind of, in a, in a sense, playing host tonight. It feels really sort of lovely. And being able to bring in um, a dear Dharma sister of mine um, to offer us all her deep, deep wisdom. Um, some of you have heard Valerie speak before at a retreat we had back in early March, our last retreat right before uh, we had to close the center. And, um, but many of you have probably have not, uh, at least weren't at that retreat and won't have heard her in other contexts possibly. So um, it's, it's, you know, I, I imagine many of you have been feeling surprised by how powerful it can be with, to sit with other people on Zoom. You know, you have your computer open or your tablet or your phone nearby. You may look at it or you may not look at it. It may be to your side. It may have the screen dimmed or whatever, you, however you like to do it. But there's really a difference. I, I, I imagine you, you're all feeling it when you're sitting uh, connected with others through a computer. You know, we know really we're all connected, more than connected at a, at a deep level anyway. And yet what a difference it does actually make to be sitting silently with others also in silence through the machine. It's, it's really, I've been finding it quite wonderful to, to, to be able to be doing this. And, um, but when it comes to tonight, you know, we're getting that, yes, of course, that, that direct sort of connectedness through sitting together. But we're also getting, you know, somebody uh, speaking, letting the Dharma show itself just in the form of speech. The Dharma just presenting this way of speech and right to us. And we're terribly, terribly lucky. And Valerie, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to do this and um, hope it'll be the first virtual of many more until we go back to, um, you know, in room, person to person, one on, you know, in uh, warm bodies in a room together. But this is pretty, pretty good anyway. So over to Valerie, thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Henry. Um, are you able to hear me? Great. So hello, everyone. Um, so good to see you. So good to sit with you in this way of distancing. This way that invites us to realize right now, no near or far not the slightest gap. So one month ago today, my partner, Scott, and I made the drive back to Dallas from Mountain Cloud as public gatherings ended and sheltering in place became the rule. COVID-19 became a kind of ground zero all over the world. Since then, I've been grateful to join these Zoom sessions whenever possible, sitting together, listening to Henry's talk, so, so helpful. Sitting with the heightened awareness of uncertainty all around. Sitting with grief, pain, loss, with the agony of so many. Also, sitting in the expanded opportunity for practice, sitting in stillness, in wonder, in kanzeon, just one sitting. The heart of this practice is zazen, posture, breathing, stilling the mind, one thing. Yet the koans, the teachings are so rich and dynamic, 
powerfully pointing, illuminating, turning us around with their turning words. So where to turn? Lately, I've had the impulse to take time to sit with the whole collection of koans beginning at the beginning and turning the pages until that closely fitting word leaps out. A koan for the COVID-19 world. Of course, in some sense, they all are. But what has come with this way of waiting, for me lately, has been a memory, a story. Four years ago, my 39-year-old nephew, Gabriel, died at home after 21 years of round-the-clock care by his parents. Gabriel was stricken with a sudden onset of severe MS when he was 18. By the end, what turned out to be the end, completely infirmed. Well, paralyzed, blind, not able to think so clearly. Still Gabriel but he couldn't survive pneumonia. The night Gaby died, his mother kept vigil with his body, looking for a text for his memorial service. She started with the Psalms, beginning with Psalm one and turning the pages, reading each Psalm, each song until she came to Psalm 139. So here's one stanza from that Psalm in a rendering by Norman Fisher, a Soto Zen master with Jewish roots. If I said, I'll pull up the darkness, cover all the world's light, with the dark, even that darkness wouldn't be dark, but would be bright as clear noon, because in you, brightness and dark are one. Sin addresses this you to you, to us. In you, light and darkness are one. In you, medicine and disease are one. In you, practice realization is one. In you, suffering and compassion are one. In you, life, death, not even room for a conjunction. Just one reality. This very body. God, but here? Here, but God? Your whole body. Intimately, you. So tonight I'd like to turn to a koan that is intimate to this practice and familiar to many. I hope it will speak to us in a time when words fail. Keep in mind, if just one word strikes you, let that be the sound you hear. So this is Shoyoroku, or Book of Equanimity, Case 20, Jesus Most Intimate. 
I'll read the case. Presenting. Jiso asked Hogan, where are you going, senior monk? Hogan said, I am on pilgrimage, wandering with the wind. Jiso said, what is pilgrimage? Hogan said, I don't know. Jiso said, not knowing is most intimate. Hogan suddenly attained great enlightenment. That's the case. This is Master Hogan, our Fayan. 885 to 958, whose name means great Dharma eye or eye of the Dharma. One of the five houses or schools of Zen was established in his name. My guess is Hogan has been a steady companion over the years at Mountain Cloud. Yamada Kohen Roshi had a, a great affinity for Hogan. Kohen Roshi wrote, how can we describe the special character of the Hogan School of Zen? It leaves no traces of hesitation in its path. Extreme clarity in presenting the matter of oneness. Hogan was not a master of words, as for example, Unman, nor one to make generous use of his stick in urging students on. Although he appears very simple and plain, he hides a prodigious depth. That's how Kon Roshi put it. Chizo, Luhan Dizan, 857 to 928, started out as a student of Seppo, but he didn't find with Seppo the affinity to awaken. So Seppo sent him to his successor, Gensha, or Wansha, where it is said, all of Dizang's doubts were erased. Jesus' teaching is very down to earth, things as they are. Even the diatribes delivered to his monks often end with take care. This imperative, take care, also shows up in Hogan's teaching. It's one way of summing up this practice. Take care. This case is presented as the occasion for Hogan's great awakening. In another version of the record, the scene here is part of a slightly longer story. Either way, the beauty of this exchange stands alone. It resounds and it invites us, it invites us to take the leap from uncertainty to not knowing. Or as Dogen put it, the mind of before knowing So let's take a look. Hogan is on pilgrimage with two other monks, as was the tradition, and they run into a snowstorm. They head for nearby Dijon Monastery. Jizo meets them at the gate and addresses Hogan, the senior monk. Where are you going? I'm on pilgrimage, wandering with the wind. 
walking where the wind blows, following in the direction of my toes. Jiso asks, what is pilgrimage? Here, Jiso is also addressing us. What are you doing? Who are you? Why are you practicing? Or more traditionally, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? What is the way? What is Buddha? Hogan answers, I don't know. Very honest, very exposed, nothing in mind, but still the faint shadow of that divided world, that matrix, knowing, not knowing, subject, object, inside, outside. I don't know. Jiso says, not knowing is most intimate. I don't know. That's it. Perfectly fitting. Exactly what you are is the whole of it, not a trace remaining, fully realized from before knowing, already accomplished. Suddenly Hogan matches himself completely. And what happens? He disappears. God, intimate to the whole, nothing but intimate. Again and again, this happens to the masters. Waking up to who you are exactly as you are. Nothing lacking, nothing extra, nothing to obscure. As Mumon put it, the perfect manifestation the absolute command. You disappear and the whole world comes rushing in. Your whole body. Bancho's commentary on this case says, Di Zhang's timing had not a thread of a gap. He goes right up and bumps him off. Not knowing is most intimate. This phrase has been bumping students off ever since. All of Hogan's teaching springs from it. According to another record, the story goes on. When the snow abates, the three monks bid farewell and start to leave. Jisa walks them to the gate and says, you monks usually say the whole universe is just one mind. Jisa points to a large rock in the garden or maybe near the gate and asks, so do you say this rock is inside or outside the mind? Hogan says, inside. And Jiso responds, that must be an awfully heavy load to carry around on pilgrimage.
whoa, I suddenly flashed on all the things we carry around. <laughs> Hogan is dumbstruck. He puts his bags down, it said, at Jesus' feet and asks to study with him. So for about a month, they meet daily. Each time Hogan presents his view, Doksa, interview, Jiso says, the Buddha Dharma isn't like that. Every day. Finally, Hogan gives up. This is instructive. He goes to Jizo and says, I've run out of words and ideas. And Jizo says, if you want to talk about Buddha Dharma, everything you see embodies it. At these words, Hogan experienced great enlightenment. Everywhere you turn, your true face, everywhere, intimate. When Hogan became abbot, Early on, he uh, addressed his monks with a fairly long teaching. His teachings are mostly very succinct, direct. But here it's a talk. He says, students of Zen need only act according to conditions to realize the way. When it's cold, they're cold. When it's hot, they're hot. If you must understand the meaning of Buddha nature, then just pay attention to what's going on. Then Hogan cites Sekito, the great eighth century master, disciple of Sagan, who you just heard about. Sagan, Sekito, who spawned Hogan's lineage. Hogan cites an experience where Sekito reads a text and he exclaims, understanding that all things are the self. Understanding that all things are the self. This is what the, all the ancient holy ones realized. And then again, he says, the holy ones did not have a self nor was there anything that was not their selves. And then Hogan goes on, Sekito composed the Sandokai, this poem that we know as the identity of relative and absolute. We often chant it here. I think you do too. And Hogan says, the first phrase in that text says, the mind of the great sage of India. We know that's Bodhidharma. The next line says, who intimately conveyed, you know, the Dharma from west to east, but Hogan says, the mind of the great sage of India, there's no need to go beyond this phrase. This phrase is Bodhidharma, sitting facing the wall, fully intimately conveyed right there. And then Hogan goes on, all of you should understand that the myriad beings are your own self 
and that across the great earth, there isn't a single Dharma that can be observed. Everything is you. Empty, infinite, intimate. The talk ends with Hogan admonishing his monks to seize the opportunity at hand. Don't get tied up in trying to understand form in the middle of emptiness or emptiness in the middle of form. That's nowhere near it, he says. All of you, just do what is appropriate to the moment. Take care. Take care. Some years ago, I was at Sashin with Rion Roshi. It was a NASC Sashin that year held in Toronto with more than 60 participants, many, many seasoned sitters. I was sitting with Joshu's giant radish, that koan one of the Roshi's favorites. Just dissolved in its power, the power of Joshu's teaching. In the early morning sitting, I had an experience of being enveloped in red light like fire. It was riveting. Whenever a thought would arise, a flame would fly up and engulf it instantly. Very helpful. Nothing to do. Everything done. Then Rion Roshi gave a Tesha on not knowing is most intimate. I'm sitting there in this heightened state, sense of Joshu's power all around, flames at the ready in the event of a momentary distraction. The Roshi was presenting, evoking this world of not knowing, transient, transparent, translucent, completely empty, and at the same time, absolute capacity, infinite possibilities. At some point, he said the words, so near. So near. And suddenly the drama of my experience ceased, fell away. I think I heard the words, not necessary. What appeared was simply this empty, infinite world. In the words being said, the Sangha listening, the light on the floor, so near. Yesterday, I Skyped with a student whose face was full of grief. Her uncle died this week from the coronavirus. He was 70 in excellent health, a recently retired neurosurgeon. She shared one line to convey his character, a line he liked to say. Don't say anything unless it is kind, true, and necessary. 
After his death, the extended family held a Zoom gathering, a memorial, a remembering. The student told her uncle's immediate family, the thing I remember most about him is how much he loved you. Kind, true, necessary. Then she told me, death is so near already dead and so near. Along with the first line of the Sandokai, another gift we have from Sekito is the last line of his song of the grass hut. If you want to know the undying person in the hut, don't separate from this skin bag here and now. Earlier in the poem, Sekito writes, turn around the light to shine within, then return. The vast and conceivable source can't be faced or turned away from. Let go of hundreds of years and relax completely. Open your hands and walk innocent. Innocent, before knowing, intimate, boundless, here, now. Hogan's teaching brings it home, brings us home. A monk asked, what is the ultimate teaching of all Buddhas? Hogan said, you have it too. A monk asked, what was the style of the ancient Buddhas? Hogan said, where can it not be completely seen. <coughs> How often Rian Roshi has said, holding up his stick, the point of Zen is to let this stick be a stick. Nansen pointed to this when he said to Joshu, when you have really reached the true way that is beyond all doubt, when you become you. Or if working with Mu, if you become Mu. You will find it as vast and boundless as the great empty firmament. So intimate. I chose this koan in part because of Wanshi's verse, beautiful and fitting. Instead, though, um, I'd like to close with a short passage from Dogen's Shobogenzo, this chapter <clears> on <throat> the Bodhisattva's four methods of guidance. Dogen writes, when you leave the way to the way, you attain the way. When you leave the way to the way, you attain the way. When treasure is left just as treasure, treasure becomes giving. 
You give yourself to yourself and others to others. This practice of Zazen has been described as silently not influencing anything. Everything maintaining, no one doing anything. Silently not influencing anything. At the same time, this is saving work. I don't just believe that. It's a fact. Work we cannot but offer to the whole world. So take care. Thank you for your practice.